mobile robotics are in the KUKA world called KMPs. And what they are called, what that stands for is KUKA mobile platform. So what are those? Well, mobile robotics, the most well-known robots we already know, although this is of course not a KUKA uh, robot, is what we send to other planets. But the basic principle is actually the same. It's a moving platform where you can and cannot have additional equipment mounting on top of it. And it is moving about autonomously. It's not a remote controlled vehicle. And in the KUKA world, we have since quite a few years, quite an extensive range of products here. And those of you <clears throat> who joined our webinar on this topic in April last year know that we have since some years, a what we call a KMP200 platform, which is a platform with a 200 kilo payload. We have also a 1500, a KMP1500, which obviously has a payload of 1500 kilos. We also have what we call KMP Omnimoves, a bit larger platforms, up to three tons, but not only limited to three tons, they are discernible in special steps, which is six, seven, 15 and 25 tons, uh, and even up to 100 tons as uh, project-based uh, uh, solutions. But together with KMP, when we combine a KMP with a robot, we call them KMRs, which obviously is the KUKA mobile robots, which to make a long story short is a mobile platform combined with one of our robots. So we have a standard product called KMR EVA, which is basically the KMP 200 together with our Agulus, no, sorry, our Cobot robot, the EVA. But we have also made a few project-based robots which combines a platform and a normal industrial robot, which we call the KM, KMR Quantec and the KMR KR60, which will which will be expanded this product portfolio during the year as well. So, but today we will be talking about the new product in this range, which is a KMP600. And the 600 is obviously the payload of it, but it's also called a diff drive. And I'll get back to you just shortly what, why this is called a diff drive. And this fits right snugly into this gap. We had a pretty big jump from the 200 to the 1500 payload, but we're now filling this empty space with our new KMP600 which is available for order right now. It was released in the beginning of, the, of April. So let's take a little bit deeper, dive into that. I mentioned that, and this is what it looks like. It handles a payload of 600 kilos. And for communication, it uses wireless ethernet, a standard Wi-Fi network. It's built for easy maintenance, of course, with easy access to uh, all the parts within. Uh, it has the option of wireless hand guiding and when and what to use that for. Uh, I'll come back to a little bit later as well. But for the observant attendee, they see probably recognize uh, the remote control, and yes, it is actually one of these Xbox controllers which are used to remotely guide them. Uh, it's battery op operated, obviously. 
Ah. Let me. I think this is better. It's battery operated, obviously, with Leon batteries built in and covering eight hours of running time. And the charging time is one and a half hour time. But these eight hours are, of course, can be prolonged or be even be shorter. It all depends on the load and how the frequency the carrier is used. But it's built for eight hours of continuous use. It also has a high level of safety around it. It uses laser scanners in its main driving select, selection direction. It means that it has a front and a back end, actually. Uh, equipped with four emergency stops. And during movement, it has both uh, audio and visual signaling as warning as it can. It can be equipped with an optional laser scanner so that it can move equally in both directions. And talking about options, it can be equipped as an option with a lifting device on board. So this area here can be used as a lift as well. And another option which will be available is the 3D obstacle avoidance, a 3D camera. I'll get back to this quite shortly. So a little bit about the base, more about the basics. The carrier is one meter long with and 750 millimeters wide and 350 millimeters high. It has a loading area with lifting points uh, attached to it in a square of 450 uh, millimeters distance. And it has a turning diameter of 1,115 millimeters. So it can actually turn on the spot. And as I mentioned, the payload is 600 kilos. And if we continue to have a look at it, we will see that the traveling speed of it is up to two meters per second, which makes it faster than the other KMPs we have in our portfolio. And the position accuracy is plus minus 10 millimeters. This position accuracy can be enhanced by a coming options which will come later this year, actually, also. And a whole unit is IP54, which makes it significantly less uh, sensitive to dustier environments. And as I mentioned just earlier, there is an option of a lifting device uh, on board, and you can see it here on the right side. And the total lifting stroke has a maximum stroke of 60 millimeters. But it's not like an operated air cylinder. It's actually a positioning lifting device. That means that we can vary the lifting stroke as much as we like up to 60 millimeters. And the lifting cycle is a little bit below three seconds to go the complete distance. But why is it called diff drive? For those of you who are, who are familiar with our earlier KMPs, you know that we have these Omni wheels on board, which makes gives the uh, platform the ability to go sideways or diagonally sideways, to crawl sideways. And the KMP 600 differs in one major way from the rest of our portfolio in this case, in, in the basic that it does not have these Omni wheels. Instead, we have what is called a drift diff drive. And to explain what that is, is that we have two main drive wheels, independent drive wheels, uh, midships on the units, so say, with supporting wheels in the corners. That means that we can actually use these drives to turn the 
vehicle on the dime, so to speak, but we cannot make it go sideways, which isn't that big of an issue because as you probably noticed before, the layout of this unit is pretty squarish, not completely squarish, but pretty squarish. And the load is typically, load area is squarish. So thanks to its dimensions, the need for it to go sideways is reduced. And that is also what we see here again, as I showed you earlier, that is that we get a turning radius, which is equal to the diagonal of the vehicle, which is 1,115 millimeters. So this is a complete spec sheet. Uh, I won't go through them all, but a few more points could be interesting, such as the safety category of it, which is a category three or a PLD. And also the ambient operating range in terms of surrounding temperatures, which is between zero and 45 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, the operating time, the batteries we have talked about, they are at peak capacity of 37 ampere hours, by the way. And the vehicle itself is also equipped with an application interface, which sits here on the top. And what the application interface is about is when you want to install additional equipment and on top of the vehicle. This could be rollers or other material handling equipment. So the vehicle is actually prepared with three contacts, which contains uh, signal interfaces for external emergency stops or digital inputs, the digital outputs, but also power supply for whatever equipment you choose to install on top of it. And those power supplies are both for 48 volt DC or 24 volt DC. So it's prepared to handle external equipment built on top of it, and it's even prepared so that you can expand this IO interface with back of uh, rim, uh, distributed nodes, if you like, operating on twin cats or ether cats, they call it. Now, if we now look into the safety of the vehicle, uh, we have laser scanners, lidars in the front and optionally in the back of the vehicle. And those areas are divided into several zones. That means that when an obstacle is discovered, depending on the distance, the vehicle will automatically lower its speed so that it has a significant uh, significant time to stop before it in, comes into danger. And when an obstacle or an operator enters into the zone one or field one, as it's called, the vehicle will stop. Otherwise, depending on the distance, the vehicle is still allowed to move, depending on the distance of it. This is, of course, also uh, configurable uh, if you need to take a load into account here. And as I mentioned before, it has it fulfills the category three or PLD in the safety categorization. Now, when we look at the leader, uh, leader or the laser scanners, uh, laser is, as you know, a pretty narrow beam. That means that it will detect any obstacles in the height of 150 millimeters. That means, of course, that will detect any operators because we humans are still not able to fly. But if we have very small obstacles, such as which are lower than 150 millimeters or obstacles that are actually not fastened in the floor or standing on the floor higher than this, 
it will miss those obstacles. And therefore, beginning the summer, we have an option which is a th which can equip the vehicle with a 3D camera, which will detect all these obstacles, which are either lower than the 150 millimeters or higher, up to four meters above ground, actually. So that is an ob another option which will be available this summer to the vehicle. Uh, and talking about movements, let's talk a little bit about uh, the navigation possibilities. And the simplest forms of carriers are manually operated or remote controlled. But for self-navigating vehicles, there are several solutions available. There are quite common are inductive guidance, that is what you've all probably seen, where you have inductive uh, threads uh, in the floor which the carriers are following. Quite common are also magnetic grids, which is basically the same uh, reflection uh, solution. But you also have quite common uh, various type of optical guidance, uh, usually some kind of rotating laser with or without reflectors to allow the carrier to navigate. Or even in some cases, there are enhanced GPS functions in, in terms of indoor GPS. All these five basic solutions require an installation in the layouts you have in the in the facility you're working in, which means also an investment in form of an infrastructure. So what we at KUKE instead have are using, and we are using it not only for the KMP600, but for all our carriers, is something called a SLAM navigation. And what that is, is a solution that does not require an infrastructure in the facility you need in terms of reflector or magnetic inductive uh, uh, wiring or, or so on. It's no requirements at all. The only thing we need in the facility is a wireless network so that the carrier is able to operate. It does not use the network for navigation, but it's necessary for it to communicate. So what is the SLAM navigation then? Well, how you set up this is basically by answering three questions. The where the first question is, how does the world look like? And for that, we need a map usually. And the easiest way of creating the map is actually to, using the remote control, drive the vehicle around where it is supposed to operate. The vehicle will then use its scanners on board to build up the map. So by driving it around, it will use its scanners and build up a map and save it to the uh, master platform for this. If you don't want to drive it around, it is also possible, of course, to import a CAD import. Uh, so if you have a layout on CAD and use that as a base for your navigation as well. Once that is done, the vehicle then uses its scanners to compare the input with the maps. So it uses the same scanners it uses for safety, it's also used for navigation. So by using its scanners, it will recognize what it sees compared with the map we've either imported or created by driving the, it around. And finally, we need to define routes, how to get from A to B, a, a description, basically. And that is done by creating paths, basically. So, and we can also create alternative paths from A to B or B to C and so on. This is how the SLAM navigation works. And that move us, moves us into 
the software environment of our KMPs, which are the same for all of them. And that is that we have a central fleet manager that is used, and that fleet manager handles the vehicles. And it also handles the orders. And the orders, the transportation orders, could be coming from any type of equipment. It could be from an ERP system. It can come from a local PLC system in a machine cell, for example, or any type, or a local HMI or an MES system. There are defined APIs and an interface system, how to create these orders inside of the fleet manager. And the fleet manager will handle the vehicles Whether it's one or 10 uh, vehicles, you still just need one fleet manager. And it could even be a combination of different types of vehicles here. It could be a KMP 600, a KMP 200, 1500, and even KMRs on board. The fleet manager will handle this as well. Of course, there is a configuration mode, a programming environment connected to this, which is done offline, where you do have a visual of the map. And down in the corner here, you see the scanned environment the wagon has scanned. And here you can define your routes and your traffic rules, equally important. What will each carrier do when it detects another carrier or detects an obstacle or it detects an operator. All this is defined in our navigation solution. And this is done graphically in terms of map and otherwise a Java programming environment, which is then deployed down to the fleet manager system. That means that this, although our KMRs are called mobile robotics, that means also that this programming environment is quite different from a normal six axis articulated robot, actually. So uh, we emphasize the need of some training to get up and running with this software. It's not really the same. It's not much more complicated, but it's not the same as a robot. So to successfully employ a project here, some additional training on these platforms are required. But of course, in the software environment, we cannot only do the programming. Of course, we need to simulate our material flow to make sure that we have the capacity. We need to check our traffic rules we set up. We need to plan our path and optimize those. And this is all what we can do in our navigation solution which is then downloaded and employed to the SLAM navigation on board of the vehicles, which gives us a high precision, plus minus 10 millimeters. We have object-based paths. That means that it knows its paths and it's an alternative paths. And all this is then applied and utilized with the onboard scanners on the vehicles. So this pretty much sums up today's webinar. Again, this is the complete range of products we have. This is a rapidly growing market for us. So expect more products in this range during the coming months and years. Otherwise, uh, don't hesitate to get in contact with us regarding these projects. Industrial Intelligence.